Welcome to Wise Wealth Podcast. We've got an awesome guest on our show. We have got Marzio, who's the founder of A Note Music, which is the leading investment platform within music royalties. It's absolutely fascinating what we're going to be discussing today of how you can actually invest within your favorite songs and musicians. And he's got a brilliant track record and background within fund management within Luxembourg and was listed on Forbes under 30 in Italy in 2022. So we've got a really, really expert guest that's coming onto the podcast. And I'm intrigued to see exactly where this conversation goes. So hang around. So welcome to the show, Marzio. It's amazing to have you. Um, I'm not going to do your introduction. I want you to introduce yourself. If you can, give us a bit of a background about yourself and... Uh, where did, you, where did your journey start? Thank you, Samuel, first of all, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. And my name is Marzo Schena, and I'm co-founder of A Note Music, uh, which is uh, the leading European marketplace for investing in music royalties. My background and my journey started in the, in the financial world, in the financial, in the, in the, in the business world. I mean, I, I started finance. I... I worked in finance, the buy side, in the sell side. I think we have something in common uh, because I, 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 specifically during my thesis, I, I developed a strategy for trading options on FX futures, shorting and buying vol of vol, volatility to volatility. So yeah. very mathematical oriented. My background is very financial modeling, very uh, you know into developing new models for basically creating trading strategies based on quantitative financial modeling and somehow trying to create kind of a passive source of income by understanding something in the market that maybe the, the rest of the market or some inefficiencies that the rest of the market hadn't spotted. So basically with this kind of mindset that, uh, that I had uh, when I was a fund manager in a usage fund here in Luxembourg, I discovered I, I stumbled upon music. Stumbled upon some uh, music publishers, you know, at events and record labels that kept telling me when I was asking them the question of why they were investing in music rights or how their music investments were performing. They kept telling me, you know, with a lot of ease that, yeah, you can make more or less, I mean, minimum 10% on a yearly basis doing basically nothing. If you buy music rights from famous songs, from hit songs, from old songs, they keep performing. People keep listening to the songs. You, you have to do basically nothing. Right, and that, that was the moment of negative interest rates. So you know, I, I was extremely hit by this, uh, by these statements, and so I decided with uh, my future co-founders to actually dig into that world, dig into how music is produced, music is created, but most of, most and foremost, how music is monetized. So came in the idea of creating a marketplace, a trading platform, kind of the e-toro of the music industry to democratize access to the asset class. And here comes, you know, music as our, uh, you know, our platform was launched in 2020 and uh, here we are. Wow. So I suppose from 2020, where's the company now? How's it, how's it progressing? And um, what, what sort of topics are you, what were you working on at this moment? So the platform has progressed a lot from the point of view of, you know, improving the UI, the, United, the user experience, educating also our, our customers, our investors, our clients enlarging also the investor base. So at the beginning, we, were, we, we thought we based ourselves on the assumption that actually investing in music was something more for the fan base, you know, more for, I like a song, hence I really want to be part of it. I want to be part of the life of the song, of the, I want to support the artist. Uh, more and more and more, I mean, as we progressed, we saw emerging kind of also another class of investors, which is more the retail investor, and also recently the professional investors. You, which is somehow, you know, uh, uh, pointing out to an interest from the wider financial ecosystem into the asset class of music. And then we started seeing like popping up in, uh, in the news information about big artists like Bruce Springsteen and uh, Neil Young. Uh, recently, uh, you know, like a series of artists, you know, like selling their catalogs uh, to big private equity funds. Yep. So we, we, we started on the side, I mean, probably we're doing something right, <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah, you're right. the, the intuition uh, four or five years ago that music is a very interesting as a class was somehow right. So yes, now we have evolved to a community of more than 27,000 investors, registered investors. And right now I think we're heading to 28. Uh, we have catalogs on the platform from nine different countries. So we 
start to have kind of a good representation, I believe, of the wider music royalties industry. We have uh, we can, can buy into shares of investing songs from Avicii, from from Beyonce, from The Who, The Kinks, uh, Drake on our platform, as well as uh, French songs, Italian songs, Polish songs, uh, Danish songs, K-pop was one of the recent additions. Uh, and um, right now on the platform, it's it's really interesting because having many different countries represented, the, the royalties are paid to investors pretty frequently on average every four days. If you have a diversified portfolio of yeah. uh, you know of all the catalogs on the platform, returns are around ten percent over the past three years, year on year. A little bit north right now because catalogs are getting priced right now with the light premium also because of the uh, higher interest rates which is something that of course is affecting the pricing across multiple industries um and yes we are pretty satisfied we keep building the platform always improving functional the new functionalities somehow also maybe some prediction methodologies and uh, yes yes never stop never stop innovating so I suppose from from our perspective so if you're if you're getting sort of like an average return of say 10 percent per annum so can anybody so you said you obviously got you know you've got a huge portfolio of investors can they they just they do they just sign up to your platform and then invest is it that simple or is there like a due diligence process minimum investment criteria and things like that so yeah we try to make everything as simple as possible of course <laughs> so from the sign up to the to the actual you know to actual activities should be as streamlined as possible but yes it's a, it's a process that consists in sign up KYC process, so you need to you need to perform KYC. We need to know, I mean, for regulatory purposes, of course, who who our clients are, right? And as soon as the KYC is is, is concluded, you can upload uh, any amount of funds that you might, you might desire. Uh, the minimum investment is really uh, meaningless. It's like six euros because the the smallest catalog, uh, the, the catalog with the smallest share is uh, six euros per share. After the biggest, I think, is 40, 45 or forty something. Wow. And then you can, I mean, we see more and more investors actually buying into one share of all the catalogs or multiple number of shares from the same, from all the catalogs on the platform to acquire kind of a diversified spectrum of catalogs, like the old catalogs, catalogs of songs maybe they don't know, uh, in order to have, you know, like kind of, again, diversification within the diversification. And it's interesting because, again, by purchasing kind of again a diversified portfolio the royalties can come out immediately i mean the next royalty pay up for us is scheduled tomorrow then the next one is uh, also on friday because the different payers of royalties i mean for example in the uk you have prs uh, in france you have sasem in germany you have gema for the songwriting part in the us you have bmi ASCAP, CI in italy sky in spain and so on they pay out let's say between twice and four times a year right so if you put everything together, you know, you create kind of a, you know, you, you receive royalties pretty, pretty frequently. That's amazing. Is it, is it, and is it quite liquid as well? I know it sounds strange, like from an investment perspective, or is it like if I buy it, I now own that royalty for life and I'll get this continuous payout? Or is it I can actually sell that and buy, buy into rights of another song? Yes, indeed. Our mission was to democratize access to this and to make this as possible, right? Of course, we cannot grant the existence of a liquid market, but we see that the market has evolved to be to become a liquid one. So we, I mean, we have a secondary market, so trading. I mean, we have kind of the primary market and the secondary market. These are the two main markets, the two markets that we have on the platform. And we see investors buying in, going out, coming in, uh, selling, and then coming back. Especially after they receive the royalties, there is usually an next dividend, <laughs> very similar to what happens in America. So it has reached a level of efficiency, which is, you know, making us proud. But this happened like after one year that we launched. Since mm -hmm. then, you know, like when there is a royalty payout, the catalog typically goes a little bit down in price because people maybe are trying to exploit some arbitrage, selling here and buying the catalog, the upcoming catalog, which is paying royalties. So you see all the most of the functioning of the traditional, you know, I would say markets, you know, you can find them also on our platform. And this is totally nature of. So it's, uh, you know, the laws of the financial markets, they, they pretty, uh, pretty, they hold also on ours. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds interesting. It's almost quite a new market then in, in Ukraine. It's pretty, uh, it's a big thing, isn't it? You started it in 2020 to then become sort of market leader in that aspect within the space of two, three years. It's, uh, 
it's pretty impressive to get to that that stage. I suppose why why from a musician point of view, if there's these royalties there, wh why are they selling it for a lump sum? I mean, what you know, other than the lump sum, I suppose if there's good royalties and good returns, you know, you're talking ten percent a year, that's a good that's yeah. a good return. I mean, again, if they're getting that sort of ten percent from a royalty perspective themselves, why? Why, why would they go take that jump, I suppose? But the, the reasons are really many and different. I mean, the main reason actually is that this market existed much before any other music was created. So, and this is something that we also discovered because we didn't know at the beginning. We thought, oh, wow, it's going to be complex actually to go to an artist and actually convince him, you know, like, do you want to sell? I mean, what are the, what will be the drivers of the conversation? Why will he sell? Yeah, the fan base approach, higher visibility. No, the point is that actually the music industry is already an industry which is based on transactions, transactions of music rights. By the, the first moment that the song is created, you have a songwriter coming together with the publisher, the, then they find an artist to sing the songs, which is usually represented by a label. You already have more or less three or four transactions, just the moment the song is created. Let's split the, the copyright here and there between the songwriter and the publisher, and then between the artist and the record label. And then from then on, you have at minimum, you know, like kind of four actors that hold the portion of the copyright of a song. And any of them, typically, you know, by how the music industry works, they actually engage in transactions with other players. Maybe a publisher might be selling to another one. They might be selling to an investment fund. They might be selling them to a major and so on and so forth. So through the lifespan of a song, there are, there are transactions that constantly happen. And what we do is simply we, we, we onboard these transactions on our platform. We try to make them more liquid to achieve standard valuation methods. And one of the reasons why artists are selling, um, the main probably reason if I put myself in the shoes of an artist is diversification. Because of course, everybody wants to diversify. When the vast majority of your income comes from the, for your own work, I mean, yeah. you might want to diversify yourself or you might want to sell or to list a portion of it, right? Because not always we have 100% of an, an artist selling 100% of the royalties. Many times it's 5% or 10% or 15%. So to maybe, you know, like achieve some, 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 some revenues or some financing for future projects. Because at the end of the day, the music is a business. The music business is business. You need to have investments. It's capital intensive. That's very, very, very interesting. And I suppose, can the royalties die out? You know, let's assume you take an artist and their songs just sort of start, you know, dwindling. People aren't listening to it. It's not on their playlists. Does that, is that a thing that can happen? <laughs> Um, I mean, typically, from a legal standpoint, copyright on the composition side lasts for 70 years, it's likely depending on which country, 65, 75, anyway, let's take 70. Uh, after the death of the last author, okay, so really, really long term. On the, um, on the recorded side, it's 70 years after it's recorded. So this is kind of the natural lifespan, right, from a legal standpoint. Now, from a lifespan of the royalties, typically what you see is that a song becomes super popular after it's released, you know, three, four months reaches its peak, right? Yeah. And then it fades down, right? And then after one year, maybe there is a seasonality. If it, if it was a summer hit, the next summer people still listen to it, it still goes in yeah. radios, broadcast, and so on. Then the third year, fourth year, and fifth year. Then at the fifth, between the fifth and the seventh year, this is pretty much across the vast majority of the songs, they reach a plateau, a minimum, which is usually higher than zero, right? And then typically, if people keep listening to the same song after five or seven years, it means that it's it's in their heads. Yeah. So for whatever reason, I mean, the, the, they like it, you know, like it's in your head. You keep like whistling under the showers and so on. So it's part of your playlist, probably as you said, or simply you look for it or it's, you know, um, so this is when it's typically the moment in which you can see a song starting growing, growing in royalties. This is what happens in most of the songs in most of the, in the music industry. And then you also have some potentially positive risks. So let's say that uh, it becomes popular again. Why? Because the 90s, songs from the 90s now are more popular. Yeah. Or because there is a TV series that makes us discover how the 70s were super cool and everybody goes back to listening to songs from the 70s, right? <laughs> So yeah, there's really a life cycle that is typically a generational. And the true thing in which you're investing when you're buying music rights is the psychology of people. So you're investing and you're somehow betting on the fact that the psychology of people and musical tastes are going to remain the same. 
I find, yeah, I find it fascinating because I've got a friend of mine actually that was, um, uh, it was a big hit in the 80s and um, he's the main singer for a, a band called Redbox and okay. they've got a song, it's called uh, Chenko and it's like, a, it's, a, it's one of those songs that comes out on radio every Christmas, it's a Christmas song. And that's literally where all of his royalties pretty much come from, is seeing those songs uh, that come out at Christmas. Because you know what the Christmas playlists are like. It's literally blast from the past sort of thing, and it's the same songs every year. But yeah, that's uh, I suppose that's the same sort of aspect, isn't it? More or less, yes, exactly. You have a very important seasonality effect, which is very, very, very important. Of course, I suppose your friend's song is not listened to in, in summer somewhere, but yeah, it's, uh, in that yeah. case, it's focused on Christmas. Yes, seasonality is also very Yeah, it's on, every, it's on every radio, everything on the Christmas playlist. And you, I literally, I can't believe it. I'm just like, yeah, I know you, I know that song. And I can, all I can do is, is listen to that every Christmas. So I suppose, yeah, you must do really well from the, the royalties. What's sort of like the downsides to it, you know, like, you know, an investment when you're in stock, you have drawdowns. Obviously, you have the the, the risk of loss. What what sort of loss risk do you have when you're investing into music royalties? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, point is that from a macro, let's take it from a macro standpoint. I mean, because the music industry is an industry which is always been through ups and downs, right? It's an industry which is extremely dependent on the distribution method. So indeed, investing in the music industry, like even just like 10 years ago, was a business that was somehow complex, right? Because people were still into piracy and they were downloading the songs illegally from the internet. Spotify was not still a thing, yet a, a real thing, right? So maybe one of the risks might be kind of disruption in distribution methods. But right now, I mean, streaming seems like it's here to stay and seems like really the preferred method and they really found a way, I believe, like with this kind of 10 euros, or 10 dollars, 10 pounds, and you can access all the industry, all the industry songs. I believe it's here to stay. So I wouldn't classify the distribution method as kind of a risk. You have AI. AI is super scary for the music business, right? Because all of a sudden, I mean, anyone can create a song with the voice of the Frank Sinatra and go out and put. Now here they're trying, you know, to constrain it and somehow to to avoid, of course, the spreading, of course, to, to destroy. Of course, you have copyright laws which are preventing a lot of wrongdoings. And also from the standpoint of an investor who is like on our platform, you invest only or you buy into songs only at least three years old. Somehow the AI or the risk of new songs somehow is um, limited because you're already buying. I mean, you have you're, you're basically betting on a survivor bias, right? You're only getting those songs in about five or seven years. So typically, I mean, I would say maybe a lack in popularity of the underlying artists is probably the main, the main, uh, the main drawback. But overall, it's somehow kind of a high tide which we see that over and over again in actually continuing to to to, to so, so overall it's pretty stable then in that respect um, other than sort of those I would say con the risks that you can't control you can't control the risks of AI development and what that could do to an industry but generally speaking it's based on the popularity so I suppose a, a risk investment would be someone like Kanye you know he's come out of massive favor with a lot of his sponsors and um well virtually everybody dropped him and sort of disowned him he's been seen in a negative light in the media would that affect the royalties from his music would you think it depends in some cases it does i i, I recall the case of r kelly for example in that case definitely of course had a very negative effect like as another case, I, I don't know specifically about Kanye, but like on Michael Jackson case, for example, I I mean I I, I saw reports that actually his music was still very 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 popular despite all the negative publicity, right? So yeah, in some cases it can it can definitely depending on the gravity, let's say, of what the artist does you know, yeah. and how bad the behavior is. Um, but yeah, um, typically this is kind of a, a tail um, tail risk, I would say. Um, maybe one of the most important risks to keep in mind is kind of um, investing or buying into the, the wrong royalty stream. Like, for example, streaming royalties <coughs> are pretty much the most stable ones. 
But sync, sync fees, synchronization royalties. What are synchronization? Synchronization are the revenues, income, royalties that are generated whenever your song is used in advertisement or to, in connection with another media, right? A soundtrack of a of a, of, a, of an advertisement uh, of an advertisement or a soundtrack of a movie. That's much more valuable, right? I mean, you have huge spikes even if if a song is twenty years old. So you want to remove them. You want to remove anything which is not repeatable. In the moment you are able to somehow define kind of a, a royalty stream, which is pretty much constant, is the moment in which you know, like you're just surfing the wave of the music industry in general, and then it becomes a generational play. Now it might also be the case, I and mean, maybe an, an artist do a band actually they they, they split. That can yeah. be also a negative effect, right? Um, because of course they start producing new songs, and all of them are not interested in promoting. You know, and whenever they do tours, they're trying to bring their fan base to their singles. Yeah. And so maybe that could be a downside. So there are some idiosyncratic effects, but overall, I mean, from an industry-wide standpoint, it's pretty much more stable. I suppose as well with that, for example, let's say I bought royalties and invested into, say, One Direction, then they split, and I was like, now I want to exit that and invest into um, who's done really well, Harry Styles, isn't it? Um, done really well, and he's gone and flown off the back of that. You know, then go and invest into him. I suppose my risk is the fact that I could be illiquid, right, on being able to exit those royalties because there has to be a buyer on that, doesn't there? Yes, 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 definitely. Our pattern works with the buyer and the seller. I mean, we 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 really let the market actually dictate its own lows. So, but usually we said it's pretty, it's pretty, how to say, efficient again. I mean, we, we rarely see Catholics that are trading at yields higher than 13, 14%, let's say, uh, over the past three years, uh, as well as uh, lower than 6 or 5%. So within this range, you can, you can typically always find a buyer. So do you think that sort of like A, a note music would perform better in lower interest rate scenarios because obviously the yield would be much more attractive or would the yield drop in tune with the interest rates but uh that's it that's it for sure there's a correlation because at the end of the day we're talking about opportunity costs right so yeah. um but i mean um from what we have seen is that there's a price for everything right so the price the market basically adjusts itself with a lower beta let's say compared to i don't know bonds or other you know instruments that are trading in international markets why because you only have the cost of capital effect you don't have the kind of the, the fundamental effect right so while maybe higher interest rates affect the stock also because it increases the cost of debt not just because people are you know moving away because the dividend yield is too low um, in this case uh, there is on the opposite there is typically kind of a higher um, positive effect the higher interest rates it means that somehow inflation is something that central banks they want to limit right so there is a high level of inflation high level of inflation also has an effect on on royalties like you could see like for example both uh, all of them like apple amazon music spotify they all increase by 10 percent or plus their the, the price of monthly subscriptions right right now i think like spotify for example from 9.99 is 10.99 why did they do that also because of inflation right because they have to pay more salaries and so on so uh also concerts you pay concerts more than what you were paying last year which is higher than what you were paying two years ago and so on and so forth so this of course has a has an effect positive effect on royalties that you will receive there's a lagging effect yes so the positive correlation with inflation is felt the royalties that you would receive with three months up to one year and a half lagging because it's uh, the music industry doesn't pay me royalties the moment that generated but yeah, so I would say that the effect of higher interest rates is definitely more limited compared to other markets. It's interesting. It's an interesting aspect. I've never looked at never looked at investing in music. So it's, I think even from my my perspective, I think it's very um, it's very eye opening because something like that I sort of compare it to. Um, I, I I like to put, I like to invest in. Um, it's like. Uh, commercial bridging loans and I basically have a small okay. percentage of risk against a, uh, a property on when I'm loaning uh, when I'm um, lending and that, that's sort of around a 10% yield and it's sort of quite interesting because I don't feel like I've got much downside risk on that from a property perspective um, but I think from this I think um, it's also very interesting because there's your downside risk is very limited in in what you're what you're looking at unless 
an artist sort of goes off the rails <laughs> and does something absolutely drastic, um, then you've got that aspect. I suppose um, for, for, for people listening, let's say that they want to go and invest into uh, royalties. Does, is there any sort of support structure or anything like that that A Note have in regards to how do they make informed decisions on buying into royalties, which royalties, what's right for them? Yes, I mean, uh, our customer tries to be, strives to be as informative as possible, right? To provide as many information as possible for anyone coming on the platform to, first of all, educate itself, himself or herself on what it means, how the music industry works, which at the end of the day is pretty simple. Eh? I mean, you listen to a song, someone is paying collected royalties and then they're paid to the music right owner. Um, and at the same time, on a catalog by catalog basis, showing the historical royalty streams, divided by who is paying the royalties and providing information about statistics. I mean, this catalog is trading at a price which is a multiple of 10x compared to how much ca the, 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 the catalog was generating in the past 12 months, 24 and 36 months. This is our standards. So while providing kind of granularity on this single catalog, at the same time, we try to provide some statistics again, some measures that might be are essential from, from my standpoint, from my point of view, in understanding and pricing the catalog. At the end of the day, the vast majority of the music industry recognizes the multiples approach as one of the most uh, you know, easy and at the same time complete to buy the music catalog, or at least to compare different ones. You might also want to look into the, maybe some of the underlying songs, whether they're young or old. Old is gold in the music business. The older a song is, of course, I mean, it doesn't need to exceed the 70 years, otherwise, you know, like it becomes public domain. But our Catholics, I mean, typically, as well, especially if you look at the publishing, uh, all this really, all this gold. So the, the older the songs are, the better. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we really try to be as as, more, as as educational as possible, but yet at the same time as simple as possible. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting as well because you're saying old is gold do you find do you think like when we talk about the future of this industry and um how it develops that i feel like there's a lot of music that comes out now where actually you go oh yeah that was cool for a couple of weeks and then you never hear of it again do you not do you feel like you don't have that sort of like sticky stickiness that you used to have in the olden tunes do you think that could affect this industry you know in the next 30 or 40 years down the line Probably, probably yes. Right, right now there's a huge amount, of pile of music which is uploaded every day on Spotify. You know that the bar right now is at a hundred thousand plus songs every day uploaded on Spotify. Right, a hundred thousand. Now the question is, among this all, that there's a huge. So how to say, um, huge amount of. I mean, it, it, one might say, okay, with all these new songs which are uploaded. How can we, you know, make money from the from the previous ones? They might be forgotten. Uh, in favor of the new ones. That's actually the opposite, because again, you need to consider the survival bias. The vast, 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 vast majority of the songs are not even listened once. I mean, I I, I think like 50% or plus of the songs on Spotify don't even have one list, I mean, one, one stream, right? So only the top 1% or top 5% actually emerge or something and they keep being listened to. So this together with the industry somehow, uh, which is growing, and uh, I mean, Goldman Sachs, for example, was expecting that the total royalties uh, generated by the music business would double up by 2000, 2030. The compounded annual growth rate expected uh, by the end of the decade is around 7 8%. You know, um, there, is a bigger, there is a bigger pie. A portion of this pie is definitely going to, to new songs. But also there is an opposite trend here which is if you look at statistics about uh, consumption habits it came up that uh, the share of people that listen to old songs compared to new ones is growing so before it was 60 60 percent or something like five years ago now it is closer to 70 percent so 70 percent of the streaming habits are connected with old songs where old if i'm not mistaken refers to songs older than three years yeah. So, you know, older songs, again, they acquire more value also because people right now, maybe they don't get attached too much to new songs. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose it's like a time thing as well, isn't it? It's actually letting that song settle down. And if you are going to buy the rights of something, you're going to buy the rights of whichever few really blossomed within that sort of decade period 
that um, you 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 go back to in your playlist to listen to. I suppose, I suppose it makes sense, doesn't it? Because you, you you filters through all of those songs. You're not going to buy royalties in a song that not many people are listening to. I suppose. Um, so I suppose from your perspective, like what sort of what 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 criteria do you have of going right? Let's list this royalties on a note music like what do you look for that decides whether it goes on there or not well we we are um, we are operators of the marketplace right i mean the marketplace is a two-sided marketplace so we we try to have the least possible impact on what comes on the platform and what doesn't of course like trying to keep it balanced so not focus too much on catalogs from a single territory from a single country or single genre so up to now we have been building you know like kind of this diversity nine countries i was saying catalogs from at the beginning we started with poland uh, france italy then we added denmark canada united states and now we recently added also germany as well as k-pop catalog, catalog from korea so you know we i <laughs> many times i i'm actually obliged to listen and to like songs that i mean i would never actually I've even listened to, right? I mean, of course, I have my my preferences, my tastes, but I mean, we need to be agnostic as much as, much as possible. And then you just look at the statements. You, re you receive the statements from whoever was, is paying the royalties. You put them into our files, into the valuation methods, you compare them to what is priced on the platform. Then you get very easily the valuation range for the catalog. The music right owner is happy with, with that. And then you proceed with the listing. And then it's... Uh, game it's amazing so would you say from the market from the marketplace you're sort of like the broker sort of um we are we are yeah i mean we are i mean the broker is typically one-sided right so the broker is or i mean yeah i mean what we do is that we we operate the marketplace so we we try we i mean our mission is to be in between and to protect both investors that might not be educated about the music industry as well as music returners who themselves might not be educated in valuation methods so we try to put together both of them. So yes, in, in, in these regards, we can be considered kind of the intermediary. Yes, definitely. The marketplace operators and uh, yes, and probably a function like the broker is somehow uh, ticking the box of what we do. Do you think that you'll see, um, well, I suppose I'll just ask the question, do you see much of an interest from an institutional level coming to the marketplace? Rather than institutional, from a professional standpoint, I mean professional because institutional are I mean, pension funds. Pension funds they have uh, much bigger tickets and they are more interested in you know investing in a fund, for example. So we have been evaluating the opportunity of creating a fund. We have done something together with uh, players whose job is indeed to issue um, certificates, instruments, creating SPVs for buying into, and we have done it. Right now, those subscriptions from in, in, in these opportunities are more towards the professional investor. So the family office, uh, yeah. we see family office is extremely interested in the asset class. They love it because it's diversi diversification, cash cow, and growing as well. So kind of, you know, ticking the boxes of all of three. And then somehow also protecting from inflation, which is also positive. Yeah. Yes, the, the answer is yes, definitely. We're seeing growth in that uh, in the spectrum. It's interesting. Do, so I suppose it, the trend in itself is moving to the upside. Do, do you think you'll see a lot more individuals putting music royalties in part of their their day to day portfolio? I suppose. Um, I believe. I believe. Yes. I mean, I, 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 at least that's a trend I'm seeing. Um, you know, that the, the point is that at the end of the day, it's it's a cash flow, cash flow that is uh, cash flow that you can you can receive. You can then do what you want with the cash flow. You can reinvest it in other catalogs, and then you. You do the accrual, or you can just use it for paying your, I mean, your insurance or whatever of the car. And uh, so, yes, we see, we see this definitely this trend consolidating. I suppose it definitely makes sense from a family office point of view. It's like nice and low risk. You're getting that returns on a consistent basis as well. I suppose been in this industry. What sort? I've got to ask. What's what's the uh, what's what is your music genre that you like then? <laughs> uh, I'm in love with soundtracks. Man, I love soundtracks. You know, I, uh, yeah, yeah, soundtracks. I mean, it's really, I mean, at the end of the year, every year, because I also listen to techno, electro, uh, electro Italian songs or kind of jazz songs and so on. But soundtracks, they dominate my, my music listening habits. I mean, every year, you know, at the end of the year, Spotify actually sends you the recap, right? Why do I listen to soundtracks? Guys, you should all try. Listen to the Gladiator in the moment of 
when you're writing an email or when you're writing on Excel, working on an Excel file, you know, complicated model or whatever, it makes it better. Yeah. You know, because you have the energy of the gladiator actually, or avatar, you know, like it makes me, make, so it's really great for working. So since I spent lots of time working in the office and also calls, and so I always have it as a soundtrack of you know, my work. Awesome. So it's just like a soundtracks that can, uh, Give you that extra bit of energy to to push through, exactly. push through, push through the day. <laughs> Hans Zimmer, guys, exactly something like that. So you just click soundtracks to get the first one, best soundtracks of all time, and then you're, off you off. Know, you go. That. You get some really cool ones these days, don't you? You get like um, the, the the different frequency ones as well that can really help with uh, boosting your work output as well. So. No, it's definitely, it's definitely yeah, fun. exactly. Yeah, the new trend is actually the, the 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 other one, which is called like focus, uh, focus, which is kind of it's not white noise, right? But it's kind of probably also sometimes AI generated songs that help you focus, but it's less, it's much less entertaining. Come on, I promise you. Yeah. You know, like yeah. working on Excel file and the the, the notes of the, the Titanic, you know, like uh, something like that. It's really it's really worth it. <laughs> <laughs> you just walk, so you're walking into your office and you're sitting there working away listening to the Titanic soundtracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, exactly that's awesome. Well, I think it's been really entertaining. Um, entertaining chat on trying to find out a lot more about investing into the music space um i suppose for everybody that's listening where's the best way to um find out more information from you yes so we have an amazing website that is uh anotemusic.com a note music a note music by the way as the name is uh, a note like one note which is the yeah the smallest uh, component the nu- nuclear let's say component of a song and then we fractionalize ownership of on songs so that's the name where the name comes from. Anyway, so yes, it's uh, anotemusic.com, and then from there you can sign up. So our platform is available both from desktop for people that spend more time in front of the computer, as well as we have uh, an amazing app that can be downloaded from the Google Play, Google's Play Store as well as the App Store. And so, yeah, it depends on whether you're more by, more mobile friendly or desktop friendly. I'm desktop, definitely desktop. Yeah, yeah, desktop, yeah. I'm on my mobile all the time, so. Where are we going down that route? But no, it's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm hoping everybody listening has taken away some um, some really cool ideas around how to invest in in royalties. It's a completely new aspect for me. So um, guys, if you've um, enjoyed this, make sure you uh, get in the comments and let us know exactly what you think. Great, great to be here. Thank you very much, Samuel. Really enjoyed. Thank you for for having me. Cheers. Thanks. 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 So guys, thanks for watching this episode of Wise Wealth Podcast with Marzio from A Notes Music. I thought it was absolutely awesome. You know, listening and finding out more information about how to invest in royalties was super cool. And also seeing what the yields are, the risks are, and potentially the risk of AI to this industry in the future. But as you heard it, old is gold. So let me know in the comments if you think you're going to be investing into some of your favorite musicians from a royalties perspective. Keen to hear you and hang around. We've got some more awesome guests coming up on the podcast.